Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're back this week, and this is the first time in Fireside Chat history that we get to look ahead to postseason hockey. As usual, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, how's it feel to be talking about postseason hockey this week? Unbelievable. I did not see that coming at the beginning of the season. I, at the earliest, I thought we might be doing this next year. It's just a added bonus, and they played extremely well against the LA Kings this week to make sure that we got there. You got to wonder if Aaron Ward has now become like the messiah of hockey. <laughs> I would think that his reputation has gone through the roof, yeah, especially so. in the hearts of Flames fans. He was saying, I was listening to an interview, or not listening, reading an interview with him and the Calgary Sun, and he said there was a lot of guys on Twitter at the beginning of the season that said, hey, if the Flames win, I'm going to buy all the drinks you can drink at Cowboys. He said he's coming to Calgary and actually making them make good on those. Oh, well-deserved. Exactly. That's not a bad price to play for the Flames being in the postseason, is it? No, exactly. It's all good. Well, Matt, why don't we split our show kind of in two tonight? Let's spend the first half talking about the season that was, and let's spend the second half looking ahead to the series that's coming. Sounds like a plan. So that it was released this week that Bob Hartley in training camp told this team that they set a goal, and their goal was to get into the playoffs. And as we know, they've made that goal. And it wasn't easy. I mean, the Flames went through a lot of opposition, and there were a lot of times they weren't supposed to make it. You know, after they went on their eight-game losing streak, they weren't supposed to make it. After they lost Giordano, they weren't supposed to make it. And they battled through everything they had and all the adversity that was put in front of them. And I think we should probably look back, not just at the last week as we always do. Uh, we'll start there, but we should look back at the whole season and what's happened. But let's start with this last week, as you were mentioning. Uh, the Flames played three games in the last week. The first one was on Tuesday when the Flames won 3-2 to two against the uh, Phoenix Coyotes, and both you and I were there. What were your thoughts on that game? I thought the Flames, they played okay. It was They weren't going gangbusters on the Coyotes. They just made sure that they played well enough to get the two points. Yeah. And really, it, when you're playing a team that is as bad as Arizona you can afford to not go all out to get the two points. Even if you're just playing okay, you'll likely beat them. It looked like the Flames came in understanding who they were playing. They came in knowing it was Arizona. And you're right, they didn't play necessarily a game of the year candidate in any respect. It's not a game that anyone's going to look at and say best game ever, but they did what it took to get the two points. And that's all they needed, really. And especially that night with Edmonton beating the Kings in regulation, it took a lot of the edge off. You know, that was a weird night, because I think for the first time in history, Flames fans wanted the Oilers to win, and Oilers fans didn't. Well, it was a win-win, you see, because not only did the Flames really hurt the LA Kings' playoff chances, but it also clinched them the third last spot in the NHL. So they got a worse pick, and unless they win the draft lottery, they're going to be shut out from either Connor McDavid or Jack Eichel. So it's all good. There you go. We got our wish as Flames fans. The next game was the pivotal game. It was the Flames against the defending Stanley Cup champions, Daryl Sutter and crew from L.A., and I thought this was going to be a tough game. I thought we might see an overtime in this game. But the Flames ended up pulling it out 3-1 uh, to one in that game with goals by Goudreau, Hoodler, and an empty netter by Hoodler at the end. And when I look at that game, outside of the excitement, I think it was one of the... It was definitely one of the most exciting games, but I also think it was one of the best games top to bottom that we've seen this year. Definitely. And... Calgary came out on a mission, and they killed the Kings. And they just came out, and they outplayed them. They got a one nothing lead. They got a two-goal lead. And they just kept at it, kept the Kings to the side. Any of the shots that they had weren't exactly 
tough for Hiller, even though that he did, I think, face 34 shots in the game. Yeah, he did. And, and when uh, the Kings scored their goal in the third period, the Flames were the better team the rest of the way. So that was probably the most dominating performance by Calgary throughout a game, especially considering that you have the defending Stanley Cup champions fighting with you for a playoff spot, and they're fighting for their playoff lives, and you come and just walk all over them. You know, to me too, when I watched that game on TV, really, if you look at it, it was almost like we saw everything that the Flames had. You know, we saw them play from a win. We saw them when L.A. came back, and then they had to battle back from that. We never saw them play from a loss, but we saw every facet of their game that we've seen this year. We saw them ahead. We saw them, you know, starting to lose the edge to L.A. We saw them come back and gain that. So it felt like we really got to see every piece of this Flames team all in one game, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, and the fans, that because I was at that game, the fans in the Saddle Dome were absolutely rocking. And it was one of the most fun regular season games I've ever been to. Oh, I bet it was. Looking forward to hearing the full minute-long Go Flames Go chant prior to the National Anthems on Sunday. It's going to be crazy in the playoffs. And I think for the first time since the 30s, uh, we have the defending Stanley Cup champions and the defending President's Trophy champions not going to the playoffs. Bizarre. Yeah, it's, it's really bizarre. And I think the Flames not just squeaking in, but almost defeating the former Stanley Cup champion says a lot about the season. It seemed like it was the perfect way to end the Flames season. The Flames have battled back against everything. They've, you know, done everything people said they shouldn't. And I guess to get in by beating the champs, it just feels like it's the right way to end things, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, they top marks. Uh, there, There's nothing you can say, really, to accurately describe how good they have played this year considering the team itself was supposed to have difficulty scoring well and that's that's the thing too is i mean if you remember at the beginning of the year um Treliving said that he was staying up at night worrying worrying about this team and where the goals were going to come from he thought that we had a pretty good team but we didn't have any lead scorers and elite scorers and really if you look at it We've had a heck of a year as far as scoring by committee. I don't have the stats in front of me, but I bet we probably have a better effort from top to bottom of guys on the score sheet than any other team. I can't think of anyone that doesn't have a couple goals to their name. Oh, I know. And, like, I think the Flames have either the most or second most uh, 10 goal scorers in the entire NHL. And I think the Flames finished fifth or sixth for most goals scored as well. And that's a testament to both the depth on the team and the skill from guys like Gaudreau, Monaghan, Hoodler, and even unexpected guys like Lance Boma. Well, let's break some of those things down. Let's look at the season as a whole. We won't talk about the Winnipeg game. It was kind of irrelevant anyways. Well, um, Sam Bennett got a point. Yay. There you go. <laughs> and, and we saw Ordeo's healthy again, so that's good. Yeah. Because I'd rather go into the playoffs with Ordeo as my backup than Teason as my backup. True. <laughs> so, well, let's start with what was good about this season, the things that got the Flames to where they are. And I think if I start, I have to look at our, our veterans. Uh, Giordano had a career year. We got career years from Hoodler, Weidman, Russell, like all the guys that we're relying on to be vets stepped up in a big way. Nothing more you can ask for. Like, even a guy that didn't ha necessarily have a career year, but David Jones, who a lot of Flames fans were contemplating that they should use a buyout on him, rebounded and had a 30-plus point season. Let's be fair. Even you and I, in our pro in our preseason episodes, were saying we didn't think Jones would probably do that much this year, and we thought maybe he wouldn't end the year as a Flame. Yeah. And yet he stepped up quite effectively in a second, third line role and has been a good secondary scorer. He has. And I think, you know, the veterans stepping up, a lot of people don't understand the significance of that. But here in Calgary, where if you look at the Jerome McGinley era and the team over the past, I don't know, 10, you know, 12 years, um, 
we haven't seen the veterans being the leaders on the team. You know, we saw guys like Jerome and, and Jokinen and Bo Meester, and these guys weren't leading the team every year the way they should have been. So f- to me, to have our vets step up and take that role, that's so important for where we are with the rebuild. Yeah, and it helps when the Flames acquire players. They acquire them from winning organizations. Like, even guys like Derek England and uh, Brandon Bullig, who nobody thinks is going to be a top-notch player for your team, they have come from winning organizations, and they know how to do things properly, and that helps teach guys like Monaghan and Goudreau how to be effective at the NHL level in the preparation for the games. That's a good point. They know what it takes to win and get deep in the playoffs and what that attitude looks like. Yeah, and we've seen that from this team this year, that resiliency and the never-say-die attitude and the willingness to, even if they're down three or four goals, to still fight for every inch of space and try to come back. For sure. And I think, you know, even outside those guys from a winning organization, we saw guys, one specific guy here, Lance Buma, who's been a flame his whole career, hasn't been part of one of those winning organizations, but he really stepped up as well. And I mean, if you look at him, he put his body on the line every shift. This is a guy who I really thought was a bubble player. Um, Last year, I thought maybe this guy, you know, doesn't have a long NHL career and something just sparked in his brain this year and he became an integral part of this team yeah and that's one of those things with any team you need unexpected players to come out of nowhere and do something now that's not to say that Lance Boma can always be considered a 15 goal 30 point guy like he was this year but as long as he continues his strong play moving forward, you're going to have a legitimate quality third, fourth line player for how many ever years that he is in Calgary. Yeah, and I mean, to me, before I'd say that he can do this legitimately year after year, he's going to have to show it to me again next year. But even if he's doing it once every two, three, even four years, I think there's a guy who we've we now know what we've got there and he'll be around for a while if he wants to be exactly and i'm just looking forward to him getting healthy and hopefully returning to the ice before the playoffs begin we don't know how long his injury will be so i was talking to a friend of mine this week who had an interesting kind of comparison of lance boma tell me what you think of this man he was saying that lance boma has really become the player that Calgary needed Eric Nystrom to become. Yeah, I can see that. I never really compared him to Eric Nystrom, but yeah, I agree. Nystrom obviously wasn't going to be our top scorer. And if you look at his role in the league now, he's playing a lot of a Boma game. But yeah, I think that's an apt comparison. Yeah. Same vein as guys like Brandon Press. You just need that quality third, fourth line guy that can chip in every once in a while. Exactly. And uh, moving on from him to other successes, um, let's talk about our blue line. This is a team, and you and I even said it throughout this season, that we have a weak blue line here in Calgary. We don't have, you know, legitimate six guys on the blue line. But for the first time since the 1988-1989 season, we had three defensemen who had 40 or more points in Giordano, Weidman, and Brody. That's remarkable. Isn't it? Uh, who are the three defensemen? Obviously, McKinnis and Suter, but who else? I'd have to go look. I don't even remember. I looked it up, and then I forgot. It was McKinnis, Suter. I don't know. I could find out. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny because we've seen such a resurgence from Dennis Weidman this year, from a player that fans wanted traded last year. I mean, I remember fans online calling for his head. And even at the beginning of this year... Uh, Some fans were calling for his head. He's really emerged to me as a top three defenseman who we have to keep around here. Well, that's a testament to Bob Hartley, because right off the bat at the beginning of the year, he sat Weidman for a game and basically said that, you know, step up or this is what you're going to be doing a lot (laughs) this year. And 
Weidman responded. And, like, I, I've i watched Weidman back when he was with Florida, with Boston, with Washington, and, like, he was always poor defensively. A, a slightly better version of Marc-Andre Bergeron from years gone by. And where you just throw him out on the power play and, you know, try to insulate him otherwise. But defensively this year, Weidman has really stepped up and become a solid defensive defenseman as yeah, well. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's the thing is he's not, you know, he, he's not always been the best offensive guy this year, but I think as far as defense and being a defensive defenseman, I think Weidman's been one of the most consistent in that department. And that's also a testament to Chris Russell as well for being a steady guy back there as well. And allowing Weidman to be a two-way defenseman as well. So if, you know, Weidman goes up on a rush, he, you know, he knows that Russell's going to be there as well. Yeah, no, that's very true. So, yeah, no, I think, I think that Weidman, from what I've seen from him this year, I don't want him out of here as much as maybe I did in the, in the past. I wasn't as adamant that he leaves as other people were, but I think, um, after what he's done, I think he definitely deserves to stick around. Oh, yeah. Well, like, uh, before the season began, both you and I thought this team was basically going to be mired in a rebuild and be in Oilers territory in the standings. And, like, I know that both you and I thought that maybe we try to trade Weidman at the deadline because of that. And, uh, you know, with how Calgary has responded as a team and Weidman specifically, that it was just that idea, whole idea just went right out of everybody's mind. Yeah, it sure did. And I think you're right. Weidman being benched early. I mean, we saw this thing at the beginning of the year where, you know, guys who got benched tend to play better. And I also think it has something to do with, um, with Giordano going out, though. Ever since Giordano went out, Weidman's really stepped up to take over that kind of top veteran defenseman role. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally think that he's gotten better since Gio has been hurt. Yeah. Well, so is uh, Derek England. He's really stepped up his game since Giordano went out. Like uh, for most of the season, he was a bubble six, seven defenseman, but in the last 15, 20 games, he's, been a legitimate top four defenseman not only in his zone but he's also been creating quite a bit of offense as well oh yeah he definitely has so good to see the blue line kicking in i'm so glad right now when i look back that we signed tj brody at the beginning of the season because can you imagine what it might cost us if we had to sign him now oh you could probably add a million dollars per year at least <laughs> at least at least Two other things to me that really made the Flames success this season. One was Sean Monaghan. And I know that a lot of people in the media talked about this. I think we talked about it a little bit. Everyone was worried he was going to get the dreaded sophomore slump. He came into the NHL last year. He had a good season in 2013-2014. He had 34 points as a rookie. And people wondered, what was he going to do this year? Was he going to slump? And in fact, he doubled his numbers almost. He's now sitting at 62 points in his second season. So, you know, the, he's a slump buster if there ever was one. Yeah, and, and not only the offense. Like, if you, he wasn't even performing as well offensively, how he, much he has emerged as a quality defensive center is, to me, the more important thing. Because... We've seen star players in Calgary before, and they're not usually the best in their own zone. Number 12 comes to mind. Exactly. And having a, a guy like Monaghan, who could not only score 30 goals for you, but be that elite shutdown center like a Jonathan Taze, that's amazing. And like that's the type of player that you win a Stanley Cup with. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, I think, to be fair, we can't credit Monaghan alone. I think that for the first time, I mean, you remember last year, the Flames were flipping and flopping lines all over the place. And nobody really got comfortable with anybody. But this year, for the first time, we actually had a defined number one line. And it was Sean Monaghan, Yari Hoodler, who also had a career year, and the kid who I hope is going to win the Calder Trophy, and that's Johnny Goudreau, who 
scored 64 points, 24 goals, 40 assists in his NHL debut season. He played one game last year, but he played 80 of the 82 this year. That's amazing. Yeah, I think it would be absolute highway robbery if Gaudreau does not win the Calder Trophy. Like, Mark Stone has had a good season for Ottawa. He had 64 points as well. And Aaron Ekblad and John Klingberg for Florida and Dallas played well as defensemen, but none of them are 5'9", you know, on skates, perhaps, (laughs) with Gaudreau. And having to deal with the tough Western Conference in much the manner that he had, he did. And if you look, the Flames were expected to be a bottom five team this year. And the Flames made the playoffs largely because of the emergence of Johnny Gaudreau. And, like, on Ottawa, yeah, Stone had a good year, but if it wasn't for Andrew Hammond coming out of nowhere and, like, winning 21 of 24 games... They wouldn't be in the postseason. No. Uh, Like, if Anderson was in that, Ottawa's not in the playoffs, and it's not even a question on who wins. And, you know, the other thing I look at is, yeah, Goudreau's 5'9", and, you know, a smaller guy, but to me, he's also a fourth-round draft pick. And, you know, like, Ekblad was, you know, first round, really high pick. So, to me, Goudreau's defining all the odds. He's defining everything that's been put in front of him to get here. And I think that, yeah, if I look at it, he's definitely had the more dynamic season. And when I look around the league, more people are talking about him, too. I don't see a lot of reporters talking about Stone outside of his market. Yeah, and Stone, I do believe, was a sixth-round pick, so it's not like he's... There you go, yeah. Yeah, Gaudreau's alone and coming out of nowhere, but still, like, you even look at the shootout goals and other such things, and, like, all the plays that Gaudreau made that uh, the other forwards just weren't prepared for, you know, Gaudreau could easily have another 20, 25 points if the his line mates were on the ball every time (laughs) yeah no for sure and just looking at the uh history here the flames have had three calder trophy winners in the past in 85 86 gary Souter won it in 87 88 joe newendike won it and in 88 or sorry 89 and 90 sergey sergey makarov won and he was the oldest uh calder trophy winner ever at 31 years old so uh didn't willie plett win it as well before uh, in like 80, 81, uh, something like 80, that. 80, 81 was Peter Stasny, and 81, 82 was Dale Howardchuk. Oh, okay. I thought Willie Plett won one. Not according to Wikipedia. Okay. Um, I could be wrong, but Wikipedia is my source on this one. We all know that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but I imagine it's fairly accurate. So, you know, good company for Goudreau to be in, and it'd be nice to get that hardware back in Calgary. It's, it's been since 1990 that somebody's brought it here. When I look at, you know, and I know it's not really a requirement of the the award, the Calder Trophy, but you're right. When you look at all the teams, I think that Goudreau is the one who single-handedly has contributed the most to his team. Yeah. I don't think the Flames even come anywhere close to a playoff spot if no. it wasn't for... And, and the other thing about Goudreau is nobody expected him to make this team. I mean, even you and I, I think both said at the beginning of the season... We expect him to start in the AHL. Yeah, and he even could have went there after the first handful of games when he was pointless. And yet he managed to get the goal against Winnipeg, and it, you know, he just took off from there. And by the way, Willie Plett did win the Calder for Atlanta in 76-77. Oh, uh, there you go. Okay, so. so, okay. 76, okay. Yeah, so the Atlanta. Um, and, you know, I mean, if I look at the other guys who are kind of on the list this year for the Calder, Tanner Pearson, Ekblad, Philip, Forsen, Philip Forsberg, um, you know, some of these other guys that we we're mentioning, um, Stone, none of them I don't think have overcome those odds. Those are all guys I expected to be on the opening day roster. And the fact that Geo or not Geo, uh, Johnny Hockey, earned that roster spot, kept that roster spot when things got rocky with him, and managed to put up 64 points. I think he's, he just like the whole team, has 
broken through every barrier put in front of him. Yeah, and he has the most uh, rookie points since Patrick Kane in 2008 as wow. well. That's good company to be in as well. I'll see if there's anything else you think was a big highlight of the Flames this year. But the other one to me when I was going through these was um, the Flames were able to come back when they were behind. And I think that's been so important for this team this year is not to lose their cool, not to get wound up, but to be able to come back and play good hockey. And from what I counted 10 times this year, the Flames won when they were trailing in a game heading for the third period. So coming into the final 20 minutes of play, they were down 10 times and managed to come back. Yeah, I think that the the most surprising thing for me this season has been just the level of maturity of all the players. Like from guys that are really young like Monahan and Gaudreau right through to the veteran guys, everybody seems to have a really mature game and like there's no afraid at any point during the game like no panic at all like, and we're also okay, not seeing any down. freelancers like we have in the past either everyone's playing together well we did and he's now playing for washington <laughs> that's true so i don't know it's just un unusual as a flames fan to see this level of maturity from all the players and not getting flustered when things are like high pressure situations yeah you know the way i look at it is i think if there's an mvp of the team this year if we were to look at one guy who's made the most um contribution tell me if you would agree or if there's someone else you'd pick i think it has to be bob hartley bob hartley got the best out of every player on this roster this year that's why the flames are going to the postseason uh, that's exactly who I was going to pick. When the Flames were searching for a new head coach, my thoughts at the time were that they needed to find somebody that would utilize the players' strengths that are on the team instead of being dogmatic towards a system like it was under Brent Sutter. Well, that's and, what you and I talked about. We said we don't want to play a coach who comes and says, this is the way we play. We want a coach who comes in and says, what do I have and what can I create for a system based on the strengths and weaknesses I have? Yeah, and you look at Bob Hartley, and he's done that in spades. And looking at guys that weren't exactly counted on in any way, shape, or form to perform, guys like Josh Juris and even Gaudreau, Monaghan, etc., and he's gotten the very best out of them because he knows what their strengths as a player are and uses them in that manner. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, going back to even Hartley himself, I mean, when he was in the NHL last in Colorado, he wasn't known as a good coach for young players. He was a veterans coach. So even he's had to change his own outlook on the game to come here and adjust to what we gave him. Yeah, and he full marks. Uh, Another person that would it would be highway robbery if he doesn't win the Jack Adams this year. Oh, would you and I talked about that? We were really one of the first outlets to cover that, and we did a whole show a while ago about him winning the Jack Adams. And we said at the time it may be contingent on him making the playoffs, though we hope not. But yeah, now that he's got this team to the postseason, I I think he might as well just hand him the trophy right now. Yeah. Another guy I'm glad we locked up early. Exactly. Because if we had to lock him up after the Jack Adams, up goes the price. Yeah. Which at least his contract doesn't count to the cap, so... True. Wouldn't be as bad if he was getting paid more. And, you know, I think for the first time in Flames history, we're going to have some stability behind the bench. You know, we've he's been here for two years now. He's got an, a contract for a couple more. I think we might have a, a coach who sticks around for a while because I think we finally found the right guy. Yeah, and he's a coach that you keep until the Flames hit the wall. And, you know, if they ever do, where they just can't seem to get to that next level. Like, if they're, say, like they lose in the conference finals a couple of times in a row a couple of years from now, then maybe you try to find a different coach to get the extra distance. But 
until that problem becomes a thing two, three years from now, you know, you run with Hartley and you can't ask more from anybody. Well, that's an interesting point too, because if you look at a lot of the players coaching rebuilding teams, they don't have a lot of Stanley Cup experience. They're kind of known as these teams that these coaches that get hired come in, work with the team, and then, you know, never seem to get to be with that team till the end. But Hartley has a Stanley Cup ring. So he's kind of proven he can take a team all the way. So I wouldn't be surprised if even if we run into a block, like you were saying, unless we do it consistently a few years in a row, that Hartley do- isn't seen as the guy you can kind of do anything with this roster. Yeah. Well, Matt, let's. Uh, uh, is there anything else that you think that we didn't cover already that was really a key to winning this season for the Flames, a key to why they're where they are? Uh, one other thing. Their record against the Pacific Division this year. I yeah. do believe no, they were 22-6-1 against our division, which I, I think that was the best record of any team against their own division in the NHL. And that's how you make it to the playoffs. you got to win those games that count, which are generally the divisional games. Yeah, and that's actually also good for the postseason with the current setup, as we'll be playing either, well, well, obviously Vancouver in the first round, but likely the Anaheim Ducks if the Flames do advance. So it's good that we have such a strong record against our own division that even if we are... (laughs) <laughs> going up against some tough teams, we can win. And not just a good division against, or a good record against our division, but a good record against our tough division. If you look at the teams in the division, we have Anaheim, Vancouver, Calgary, LA, San Jose, Edmonton, Arizona. Up till the trade deadline, even Arizona was a good team on that list. Only Edmonton was, you know, not. So it's not like we've got a, a weak division. This is one of the divisions. If you look historically, these are the teams that are generally the toughest to beat. Yeah, and they won four out of the five against L.A. They swept both Arizona and Edmonton. They had a winning record against Vancouver. Not much more you can ask. No, exactly. Well, Matt, what do you think were some of the surprises this year? Was there any players or scenarios or anything that really surprised you as far as what we saw from them? I would have to list two players and that would be Josh Juris and Michael Furland. Yeah, I had Juris down here on our notes. Um I think I was the most surprised about him. I agree with Furland as well. Um and if anyone's asking, I think if you're doing a playoff pool, Furland could be the dark horse for the Flames this year. He could be the next eliminator like Marty Jelena. Yeah, he just seems to have that big game presence. If you're looking to take somebody and you're looking for a dark horse, my pick is Michael Furland. Can't argue with you there. Furland and and Juris were both guys that nobody, uh, neither you, me, anyone in the media, thought were going to make the team this year. If you looked at the depth chart and you would have told me that Juris would play a whole season here and Furland would play as much as he did, I would have thought you were crazy if we were talking. Well, you know, if we're talking like Juris playing a full season, like you you would have thought that, a, we would have had a ton of injuries, and B, how bad were they this Either year? a ton of injuries, or we shipped everybody out of here, and he was the last guy left. Yeah, like, it, but for him to come in and elevate his game and be not only a contributor on this team, but a reliable contributor. He played 60 games, 12 goals, 12 assists for 24 points. Yeah, and... He, he was effective at both ends of the ice. Like, even if he... Because he, he did go on a bit of a sl- scoring slump in the second half of the season, he performed well in the, his own zone, and that allowed him to continue getting ice time because you could throw him out there and he wouldn't screw up. Yeah. No, and I mean, a guy of his caliber and where I'd see him in the lineup... I wouldn't be expecting much more than 24 points a year. No. You know, so the fact that he got that, to me, I think that's that's probably the best season we're going to see from this guy. I don't see him continuing to give us 20-some points every year. I think this is probably going to be his career high, and it's going to stay that way for a while. Uh, Well, that's the thing. Who knows? Uh, With a lot of these guys, they're all rookies, so... 
who knows? A guy like uh, Tyler Johnson in Tampa Bay wasn't expected to do much of anything, and he had 60-some-odd points this year. That's true. You just don't know. And true. Juris might become the next Tyler Johnson, or he might just be a solid third, yeah, fourth Yeah, very well could guy. be. You don't know. That's no, the but, thing you with know, the young players. That... You just, it's so difficult to peg guys when there's no track record or game on them. Yeah, I mean, we've we've got some, you know, we know that Juris can score. I mean, if we look last year at the AHL, he played 73 games, got 11 goals and 16 assists for 27 points. So he did about the same numbers of the AHL as he did the NHL this year. Which, you know, that, that shows us, I think, even if we look through his college stats, he did about the same. Shows that this guy has some offensive upside to him. Yeah, and where that plateaus, who knows. And if we look at the other uh, player you're mentioning, 22-year-old Michael Furlan, the guy who the Flames drafted in the fifth round, 133rd overall in 2010. He played 26 games here, two goals, three assists for five points, but... To me, Furlan's not a guy I'm expecting to get a lot of points. He's a guy I'm expecting to be more of our two-way, kind of defensively sound forward. What about you? Yeah, uh, more or less like a Lance Boma type guy. Yeah. And he'll throw hits, he can drop the gloves if need be, and just be that pain-in-the-ass physical guy that every team hates to play against. And you need those. You do. Especially in the playoffs. And... You know, those are both number 86, Josh Juris, and number 79, Michael Furland. I think are both players that could help make the difference for Calgary in round one. Yeah. Any other surprises? Not really. Like, we kind of expected Gaudreau and Monaghan to be good. Not necessarily as good as they were, but... I'll throw out another one. I expected that by Christmas we would have named a starting goaltender for this team. And I think the fact that we went the whole season with a 1A, 1B really shows the strength of both goaltenders in our tandem. Yeah, I can agree with that. I just I didn't think we'd get into a season like this and have two guys and have them rotating all year. I thought one of them, especially with Hiller's record the last couple of years, would emerge as the number one guy. So it always seemed like when one of them hadn't played for a while, he felt the need to up his game. So I feel like they both helped get the best out of each other. Yeah, and having that internal competition probably saw the players have the better results. Like, if we look back last year, uh, Kari Ramo struggled r- quite badly at the beginning of the year until Red Obara came up. And gave him competition. Yeah, and then that elevated his game, and he played a lot better after Barra arrived. Yeah. And you and I talked about that at the beginning of the year. I said, I think based on that, we'd see him play better with Hiller. I just didn't know what to expect from Hiller. Yeah. And they both had pretty good stats this year. Not going to blow anybody away, but solid, respectable. For sure. And, you know, respectable enough considering how many games they played. I think if one of them played a lot more games, we would have seen better stats. But, I mean, Hiller played uh, 52 games and Ramo played 34. So it's tough to put up a lot of stats when you're playing less than half the season in Ramo's case. Matt, is there any is there anyone on this team you'd kind of say is on the opposite side this year and is a loser? Uh, well, the Flames did ship off two problem players. That, not necessarily problem players, but guys that weren't fitting in with the team's mantra in Curtis Glencross and Sven Berchi. And, you know, they've played okay in their new organizations, but the, that's about it. Like, I don't... Mason Raymond struggled for most of the year off and on. That would pretty much be the only other guy that I can think of that's been a, a disappointment in some regard. See, when I look at the two guys we shipped out, I mean... To me, Berchi wasn't a surprise. We've seen him kind of get the short end of the stick with management here for a few years, so I was expecting it to come sooner rather than later. And Glenn Cross, too. I mean, we said the guy's got to move, so I'm not surprised about either of those. And when I look down the active current roster, there's nobody that's been terrible. There's no one guy that we thought maybe like a Derek England who might be a liability. 
everybody, including England, has stepped up and become a productive member of the team. Yeah, and like even Raymond hasn't had a particularly bad season. It's just not as good as some people were hoping for. Yeah, I mean, you know, Raymond played in 57 games, scored 12 times, and got 11 helpers for 23 points. That's still not a bad season. No, and especially with scoring down across the league, like on the top end anyway. Um, and I think when you're looking at our, our first line and everybody on our first line getting as many points as they did, I mean, we've got everyone on the first line getting at least 60 points this year. That's less contribution from everybody else. Yeah, and like if you extrapolate Raymond's numbers over a full year, that's closer to like 30, 35 points. Which is about where I'd expect him to be. Yeah, so he's frustrating at times, but he's been okay. And like if you're pegging anybody to be having a disappointing season, if you're getting a guy that's more or less performing at his career level, well, that's not bad. <laughs> The only guy maybe we could say that if we look back is going to be the loser of the year, and I hate to use that term, but uh, Devin Setaguchi. The Flames gave him a tryout, he blew it, and he's looked terrible in the AHL since, and I think there's a guy who had the chance to make some of himself and didn't. Well, uh, that's the thing. Some players just lose it. Uh, you see that more commonly in a sport like baseball where like a pitcher will just not be able to get anybody out it happens it sucks uh, you know especially a guy that has scored 30 goals before but it happens and unfortunately for Devin Saguchi that was his year this year I'm hoping that he can go to Europe somewhere and try to figure out what he's doing wrong to get back into it and hopefully get a contract from somebody down the line. It's all we can hope for, right? Hopefully at some point he'll be back. And, you know, I think there's probably space from somewhere, especially if there's an expansion team coming, even if it's as a bubble forward. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, if you could pick one moment then. We've got the winners, we've got the losers, we've got the surprises. If you could pick one moment this year that will be the most memorable, what's the thing that when we look back at the 2014-2015 Calgary Flames season we're going to remember? I would have to go with Yuri Hoodler's uh, empty net goal against the Los Angeles Kings because of the fact that that clinched the playoff spot. And... It was the culmination of all their hard work and everything built towards them actually getting to the playoffs, and that cemented it. Okay, so you're thinking of a very specific moment. To me, I think when I look back, more than a specific moment, because you're right, that clinched it, but you know, there's a lot of moments that lived up to that. I think I'm going to remember the Flames' motto for this year. And we've had some crappy mottos in the past. You might remember the young guns and all that sort of thing. But the motto this year was always earned, never given. And I think to me, when I remember this season, that's probably what I'm going to remember most. Yeah, I can agree with that. You know, yeah, Hoodler's moment was special. But, you know, and I agree with you, I'll probably remember that specific goal as well. But this year to me is just the year that everyone earned what they got. The Flames are in the playoffs, and they're going to have to earn their way up to the Stanley Cup if they get there, but everyone earned and worked so hard to get them where they were, where they are. There's not three or four guys that did it all. Everyone carried the team on their shoulders. Yeah, there was no passengers at all. No. So, to me, I think it's that motto that I'm going to remember, and I hope that that takes the place of remembering the crappy Young Guns motto in my mind. <laughs> Well, before we get to talking playoffs, uh, let's do a quick recap at potential awards the Flames could bring home. This could be a big year for hardware, probably the most hardware the Flames have been looking at in a while. Um, do you still think the Giordano can win the Norris Trophy? Probably not, just because of, like, if he had gotten hurt, like, that with, like, five or six games remaining, I think he would have, but missing a quarter of the year, uh, I would expect a guy like P.K. Subban to, or Shea Weber to take it. The only way I could see a Gio winning is if the Flames go deep and he comes back and he's a huge part of the Flames winning the Cup. 
Well, the thing is, is that the awards are voted on this week oh, sometime. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, You're right, yeah. So, and I think uh, the minimum recovery time for his injury is like six months, so I don't Because I was think reading there's... today that they said if the Flames go deep, he might be back. Yeah, I doubt it. Uh, we'd have to be in the finals, and even then it would be rushing it. Do you so. think that, uh, we talked about this earlier, do you think Hartley's still a candidate for Jack Adams? I would be shocked if he didn't win it. Me too. I think if we look at the coach judged most, I forget the exact wording, but the coach who's directly contributed the most to his team's success, that defines Bob Hartley. The only other guy that I could see possibly doing it is uh, Paul Maurice for Winnipeg. But even then, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, I think the fact that Hartley came back from nowhere, I mean, he was coaching overseas and kind of emerged out of nowhere, that's part of the story for him, too. You know, Maurice has bounced around the NHL for a while. Yeah. Um, do you think Goudreau can win the Calder Trophy? Uh, again, like Hartley, I would be somewhat shocked if he didn't. And I think that the only way he doesn't is if, uh, there's some bias over the Johnny Hockey moniker. <laughs> yeah, I hope it wouldn't get that petty. This is an award for playing good hockey, not based on what you're called. Yeah. That's the only way I could see it, it realistically, because Gaudreau is the most dynamic of any of the rookies and led them all in scoring. So yeah. it, it, it would have to be something ridiculous like, oh, he has a Johnny Hockey nickname that was given to him like five years ago. It's not his fault. Yeah, like, give me a break. Any other awards you think we might see come home this year? It would be a little bit of a surprise, but I think Monaghan might be a, possibly up for either the Selkie or uh, the Lady Bing Trophy. Interesting. I don't think he'd win it, but he might get nominated. Okay, yeah, I can't see him winning Lady Bing. There's other guys I could see uh, getting Lady Bing over Monaghan. Selkie is going to be a, a bit of a, a long a long shot too, I think. Yeah, I I don't see him winning either of them, but I could see him possibly getting nominated. For those that don't know, the Lady Bing Trophy is the trophy a lot of players don't want to win. It's the it's the trophy for the what is it the most gentlemanly player every year. Yeah, I think it's funny. It's named Lady Bing, and it's for the gentleman. But uh, and the Frank J. Selkie Trophy is for the forward who demonstrates the most skill in the defensive component of the game. The only th reason I can see Monaghan, well, not the only reason, a big reason I can see Monaghan not winning the Selkie is it's voted on by a poll of the Professional Hockey Writers Association who generally tend to favor guys in the East. Oh, I'm not arguing there. I just, it's one of those things that he might get some votes towards it. And he only had 12 penalty minutes this year, so that's why I think he might be a possible candidate for the Lady Bing. Yeah, I'd have to look through the league and see. Um, according to Wikipedia again, the Calgary Flames have never had a Selkie Trophy winner. Which and isn't surprising if you look back at prior teams. No, it's not. And they've had two Lady Bing winners in 86-87. Joe Mullen won it. And he had, uh, that was his first win. And in 88-89, Joe Mullen won it again. So, yeah, two winners way back in the 80s. That's a long that's a long shot, but I think I would be really surprised if we don't come home with an Adams trophy and a Calder trophy. Yeah, at the minimum. At the minimum. I'd like to come home with the big trophy, but we'll see. That's going to take a while to get there. Yeah. Uh not this year. Maybe next year or the year after. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the uh playoff series that's coming and you know, looking around this city before we get talking about the actual trophy. The city's gone crazy. I mean, it's like 04 again. And the only thing I guess I can say about what I thought, I don't know about you, but two words sum up my thoughts about the Flames going back to the playoffs and the excitement I've seen. And in the great words of Peter Marr, Yeah, baby! I had no idea that the Flames would be able to pull this off. No, nobody did. And even in 03-04, 
Like, there was no expectations that the Flames were even going to make the playoffs that year either. And it was because, like, the Flames were still mired in the we kind of suck mode after seven years of missing. And if it wasn't for Kipper, the Flames wouldn't have made it. And you're getting a lot of the same feel this year where it's so unexpected that everybody's pumped up because of that. And isn't it crazy that our first opponent this time is the same team that we had to get through in 04? I think that there's something, I, w- I don't want to say ironic, but something quite cool about that. Yeah, and I like the fact that it's set up uh, for the divisions instead of like 1 through 8 like it has been. It makes it a lot more interesting because, like, I'd rather see the Flames play against Vancouver in round one than having to face the Anaheim Ducks, which if it was one through eight, that's who we would be playing. Yeah, it's funny because when the new format came in, I remember all of us talking on the show saying it's kind of silly and hokey and it's funny how your your opinion changes when it affects you. Yeah, and, like, I, I think it's a lot more fun to play against the teams that, you love to hate, you know, your divisional opponents instead oh, it of is for sure. some random game against, like, uh, say, Nashville or something like that. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, real enthusiastic to get up against those guys. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, if you look over the last couple of years, the Battle of Alberta has simmered out, and it's really been the Western Canadian battle between Calgary and Vancouver, so... I mean, this is almost, you know, the equivalent of a Battle of Alberta in the playoffs. And I think that's part of the reason everyone's getting so excited about it as well. Like you said, if it was Nashville, we wouldn't see, I don't think, as much excitement. Oh, no. It'd be kind of a boring series because there's no hatred of the other team at all. (laughs) Yeah, no, (laughs) sure. Like, it's different if you're in the conference finals or something like that. Then you're, you know, pumped up to try and make the finals, but... For the first round, you'd always like to play against teams that you've fought with all year to get there. And the other thing I think is cool about it being the Canucks that we're playing against is the the moment that you and I have defined as the turning point for this Flames team was last year when the Flames had the bench-clearing brawl against the Canucks. And that's where you and I have said that's the moment we pinpoint is the turning point for this team. So I think it's kind of funny that we go back to that team that helped turn this around and now we play them on the upswing. It'll be a battle. That's for sure. And a a good thing is that in the last three games that we've played against them, the flames are two Oh and one with the loss coming in a shootout. Yeah. The the season series is what two, one and one for the flames. Yes. And the first game we played this year was against Vancouver and that was our only regulation loss. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point, too, that if you look at it in five games, the Flames won two of those five, so... You know, uh, we only played four. Oh, sorry, four, you're right, two, one, and one, four games. So, in a, you know, in a four-game series, we won. Yeah, and, you know, like in that first game, uh, I believe one of the goals was an empty netter, and Hiller let in a real stinker as well, so... It wasn't even necessarily representative in the first game of how they played, because I believe Calgary actually outplayed them in that game that was as well. Way back at the beginning. Yeah. So. And the second game was right after that eight-game losing streak on the road, right? It it was the last loss in the eight-game losing streak. Yeah, the first game we played against Vancouver was a four-two loss back on October eighth, and that was when this team was just getting going and didn't look all that great. So far, they beat Winnipeg, then they lost to Winnipeg. Oh, no, those were exhibition games. So, yeah, the first game of the season, we lost to Vancouver, and then we won against Edmonton, and then we lost to St. Louis. And I know at the beginning, I wasn't thinking this team was going to go very far. No, I, we were both kind of thinking, like, McDavid territory, like how close to McDavid would we be? <laughs> exactly, yeah couple more things about the playoffs I want to run through. Um, if you look at the Flames season and how they've been divided into seven-game segments, and we've been here on Fireside Chat divided into seven-game segments, the Flames are the masters of the seven-game segment. I mean, they won, I think, all but two of those seven-game segments this year. So 
when I look at those stats, there's no reason to think that they couldn't win this one. Yeah, and having that mindset of, okay, you might lose one or two games here or there, but if you can be consistent and make sure that you get four out of the seven, at least you're not going to make it easy for the other team. Like, I wouldn't anticipate Vancouver sweeping us, for example. No. I would be surprised if we sit here after game four and we're talking about starting the golf season for the Flames. Yeah. The other advantage I think the Flames have is that it's in Vancouver. It's so easy to get there so quick that I can see them flying out the day of and flying back, you know, after a game and sleeping in their bed more often than not. Yeah. Well, I don't know about that, but it would be a little easier instead of, like, traveling, like, to Anaheim or something like that. Yeah, Dallas or somewhere like that. Um, what do you think the probability is that we will see number 63, Sam Bennett, on the Flames roster during the postseason? Well, he played rather effectively against the Winnipeg Jets and was probably the most dynamic of the Flames that played in that game. With Remember, it, though, that game was a 5-1 loss. True, but he was the only guy that seemed to be doing anything in Jets' zone. And, you know, the third period, Winnipeg scored four times, so... When I look at Monaghan in that game, I think that he was the only guy that was really playing hard because he was the only guy that had anything to prove in that game. True. And I could see, because of the fact that every goal in the playoffs is vital... I could see the Flames dressing Bennett just because of the fact that he can contribute offensively. I don't think he'd be getting prime minutes, especially in the defensive zone, but I could see him getting some ice time on the second power play unit and so on. I look at Bennett as an injury replacement guy. I think it's great for him to be up here. It's great for him to practice with the team and understand what needs to be done at the NHL level. I can't see him playing unless we have somebody hurt and we need that kind of scoring depth. I just, to me, he hasn't proven anything this year to the Flames. And I know this might be the wrong way to look at it, but he wasn't part of the group that helped get the Flames here. And the guys I want to see playing are the guys that helped get the Flames here. I'm more of the mind that anybody who can help us win, I don't care if it's David Wolf even. Like I could not care less if whoever the... 20 players that Hartley puts out there on any given the night twenty is the best 20 and that's the guys that he thinks will get the Flames a win and if one of those 20 is Sam Bennett awesome if it's not awesome yeah no that's a good point I'm either way I'm I'm leaning towards him not getting maybe he gets one game but I'm not looking at him as being a regular on the Flames roster this this uh, series but we'll see Yeah, it's one of those things that, who knows, and maybe he steps in game one and scores a hat trick. You don't know. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, exactly. So, it, it all, there's a lot of variables, and who knows. And if nothing else, I think it helps put a little bit of pressure on some of the guys in the team. If you look around and you see Sam Bennett sitting there, and you're maybe a guy like, um, you know, a... Uh, Bowleg or somebody like that who goes, crap, I got to keep my game elevated or this kid's taking my spot. Yeah, or even a guy like Mason Raymond who's been inconsistent, especially in the second half of the season. Josh Juris, Michael Furlan, like there's lots of guys that we, you know, could get usurped by, uh, by Sam Bennett. Yeah, and competition is always a good thing. For sure. Well, let's talk about some things that fans need to know about the Canucks. We know about the Flames, especially if you've been listening to us all year, you know this team intimately. Uh, But what we need to know is we need to know what we're up against. We need to know about the enemy. So a couple things uh, to know about the, the Canucks is they, like the Flames, weren't expected to have a good year. I mean, everybody thought they were kind of on the downswing. They were going to be having to start their rebuild soon. To me, the biggest offensive threat there is still the Sedins. Would you agree? Yeah, they've had a real bounce-back season after the Tortorella failed experiment. 
Yeah, the, together they're up 20 points from where they were last year, and that's kind of scary to me. Well, they've always been a really good pair of players. Uh, they have won scoring titles together, so it's not surprising that they're going to be a dynamic offensive threat. That doesn't magically disappear overnight. So the fact that they're back to being a good quality first line alongside Redeem Verbata, it, that's not surprising to me. Well, and, and Redeem Verbata is a good you know, guy to talk about as well because he's played on the first line, but we've also seen him drop down to the second line there. And one of the criticisms I've had of Vancouver over the past couple of years was outside of their first line, they didn't have a lot of scoring depth. I think if you look at the forward roster this year with, you know, guys like Verbata, um, you know, um, we've seen Bo Horvat step in and have a good season for them. We're starting to see more scoring depth throughout the lineup. Yeah, even a guy like Alex Burrows, who was absolutely Burrows, yeah. terrible last year, he had 33 or some old, somewhat like something like that for points this year. And even a guy like Zach Cassian has got 16 points, so you're seeing even him chipping in. And, you know, the more guys that they have like that, the harder it is to contain the lineup. Yeah. One interesting note is that uh, Vancouver's Lance Boma, Derek Dorsett, also got hurt and it's questionable whether he'll be able to play as well. Interesting. And on the injury front as well, it sounds like Eddie Lack is going to be starting in net instead of um, their regular goaltender, Ryan Miller, um, because Miller's still not 100%. So the fact that they're going to be icing a backup in Vancouver is something I think the Flames really have to capitalize on. Well, it's not like Lack is a terrible goaltender. Their situations, much like ours with Hiller and Ramo, neither guy is going to blow you away. So, But they're not terrible. And Lack can be a challenging goaltender. But he's also had some stinker games as well, like any goaltender. So. I didn't expect Lack to play in 41 games this year. That really surprised me. No. And Miller struggled against the Oilers, surrendering five goals. And like he even said that he's not 100%. So until he is, I would expect lack. It's always better to have a 1B goaltender that's 100% than a 1A that's 80%. Yeah, and if I'm Vancouver, I would rather have lack than, you know, I have to bring somebody up from the farm. Um, they've got some good goalies, but yeah, I think lack is nothing to sneeze at. But I still look at him as an inexperienced goalie, and I think that could work in the Flames' benefit, especially with Hiller on the other side. Won't know until the puck drops. Vancouver, too. They, they choke every year, and it's one of those things where you're going, how quickly can we get this team to choke? Well, they're a good team still. Like it, It's not going to be easy for the Flames to win. No, it's not. And I'm... Of any of the teams that are in the postseason, the only one that I think the Flames have a 50-50 shot at beating is Vancouver. So, but it is a 50-50 shot, and I could see either team easily winning this one in six games or so. Really? You're giving it 50-50 right down the middle? Yeah, I. it just depends on who gets that clutch secondary scoring, because we all know that Monaghan, Gaudreau... Hoodlers, Sadin, Sadin, and Verbata are going to score. And they're going to just... be shutting each other down, too. Yeah, it, it. I would be shocked if one first line drastically outscores the other. But the, it's how the second, third, and fourth lines do that will make the difference. And if the Flames can get clutch scoring from guys like Backlund, Bennett, if he plays Raymond Colborn, then the Flames will advance. If not, then Vancouver will. The Flames are coming into this one as the underdog, no question. And they've shown that they can excel as the underdog. Do you think that being the underdog is going to hurt them in this season or this series? No. Uh, I would actually prefer being the underdog just because it, it, the Flames have no expectations. Like, if the Flames get swept, everybody will be going, eh, they weren't even supposed to be there anyway. And they were the worst of the playoff teams anyway. Yeah, they had their run, they're out. Obviously, they weren't a good team. Let's move on. Exactly. If they steal a game or two in Vancouver before coming back home, awesome. If not, 
it's not the end of the world. Like, nobody was anticipating playoffs anyway, so uh, all the pressure is on Vancouver because they're the veteran team. They're the better team. So, you know, uh, Calgary, if they lose, oh well. <laughs> to me, I think, and, you know, the media said this all year, and I'm one of the people that said this as well, is luck has played a lot into the Flames' season this year. And I think we can all say that the Flames wouldn't be where they are if not partly for luck. And the way I'm looking at this series is luck isn't going to get you the second round. If the Flames can beat the Canucks four times of, you know, a possible of seven, that's not luck. That's skill. That shows us that this team didn't just get lucky. They're actually pretty good. Yeah, exactly. And (sighs) luck will win you a game. It won't win you four of seven. True. And, yeah. Uh, Calgary, like, it, realistically, it would be somewhat of a shock if they make it to the second round because of the fact that they are so inexperienced. And it's it would be unexpected. But, but at the same time, the same conversation was being had in 04. And I don't want to say it's going to be another run like 04. Oh, no. But we've had this conversation about the Flames before. Yeah, and... There's no expectations. What they do on the ice is what they'll do. And if they come out like gangbusters like they did against the LA Kings, they'll beat Vancouver. If not, then they'll go golfing and they'll have learned some lessons on what it's like to be in the postseason. Yeah. And that's that's all you can really ask from a young team. I mean... We're in year one of a rebuild. I can't remember the last time a team who's admitted they're rebuilding has, in year one, said, oh, hey, we rebuilt enough that we're in the playoffs. Usually it's a long, painful process. I mean, Well, like, even if you look at Chicago, right? Uh, in 04, that's when, like, the team really bottomed out. And then, like, in 05, 06, they still sucked. 06, 07, they got Kane, and it wasn't until a year after they got Kane and were sort of like in year three, year four of their rebuild that they actually made the playoffs again. Yeah. And they got skunked in the first round, or second round, I can't remember. And then the year after, they won the Stanley Cup in 09. The Flames, it seems like they've kind of skipped a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, it's, like, it's almost like, you know, we're rebuilding, but nobody told the guys in the ice. Yeah, like I was expecting the Flames to follow the same sort of a mold as Chicago, where, like, we suck for a couple of years and then are on the upswing. And I, like, I just want to like, stay ahead of Edmonton this year for, you know, appearance sake. Yeah, and... We did that. <laughs> we definitely did. But, you know, everything's uh, gravy from here on out. And I just hope the Flames can have a successful playoffs and not get blown out. Like, we have seen some te- young teams, once they do make the postseason, like the Islanders against Pittsburgh. Uh, we'll see. I'm just hoping that they perform well and can hold their head up high even if they do lose to Vancouver. Is there anything else you think our listeners need to know about the Canucks going into this season or this series? Uh, They're a physical team. They have some solid depth. They're also a slow team. And, like, they're not all their players are slow, but as a whole, they're not exactly fleet of foot. And that's where, if Calgary is going to win... That's how they'll do it. They'll use their speed game and their transition game like they have most of the year, and they will put the Canucks on their heels and get more goals. Yeah, that's the nice thing is Calgary doesn't have to adopt a new style. If the Calgary Flames play Calgary Flames hockey, they can win this series. Mm -hmm. It will take Vancouver playing outside of their comfort zone in order for them to beat us. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because, like, the teams that have beat Calgary reliably this year have been teams that are exceptionally good defensively and play a good trap while having a good transition game. Like, uh, I'm thinking of teams like St. Louis and Minnesota. See, and those teams are also fast teams. Yeah, and Vancouver's not fast. They're not particularly good defensively. 
they do have some good offensive abilities, but not the defensive side. So Calgary might be able to exploit that. For sure. I also think, and I've said this all year, I think one of our strengths is our depth. You know, I think with Vancouver, if they start to lose a couple players, they are starting to run into a shallow bench and having to pull up some unproven guys from the A. You know, Sven Berchi is obviously the first call up probably, but the Flames are so deep, especially on the forward ranks, that I think that's going to help us, especially against a physical team like Vancouver. Well, that's the thing. Like, if, say, like, the Flames lose five or six players to injury on the forward ranks, okay, you you bring Shore in, Bennett comes in, or Raymond if he takes his spot. Then you can recall guys like Poirier, Wolf, you know, and keep going. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and each of those guys is a quality player. Not you're not bringing in the forward equivalent of a guy like Brennan Evans from the 04 run who was way out of his league. Yeah, exactly. So Matt, looking at the seven games in front of us, what do you think is going to be the result of this series and how many games are going to take to get there? Calgary Flames advance to the second round uh, for only the third time since 89 or second time second time since 89 and we'll beat them in six you think it's gonna be six games yeah i think the calgary flames are gonna win this series i hope it's not just the homer and me talking um i really want playoff hockey as a fan i'll as much as we always try to have different predictions yeah i'm gonna do the same as you i think it's gonna be calgary flames in six and it's gonna be a tough six games yeah it's just I think that the Flames having home ice for three of those games and the Dome being rocking, I think the Flames will... Because they, they seem to elevate their game when the Flames fans are going absolutely nuts like they did against LA. So I think that playing three times here, I don't see the Flames losing any of those. I know that there's, just because I've been talking to people, there's also a large contingent of Flames fans that are going to try and be at the Vancouver games as well. It'll be fun. Who do you think is going to emerge as the dark horse in round one for the Flames? The dark horse? Who do you think is the guy that we aren't thinking right now but is going to come out to be the stud of, of uh, the first round? I'm going to go a little off the board-ish. I'm going to say Sam Bennett wrecks the Vancouver Canucks. You think so? Yeah, I think if he plays, I think he's got a lot to prove, and he has that chip on his shoulder. Uh, I think he wants to show that he's, you know, an NHL player for sure. I think he'll probably score two, three, maybe even four times in the first round if he plays. I think that the guy that we're not expecting to contribute, the dark horse who might come out and be the guy that we go, wow, he contributed a lot, could be Mason Raymond wanting to show the Canucks what they missed out on. Um, but I also think that it might end up being Michael Furland. Yeah, I can see that too. I think Michael Furland's going to be the next eliminator. I think he's the new Jelena. He might be the guy who gets the clinching goals we need. Well, I, I would actually, in that regard, I would go with the guy who has Jell on his number, number 23, and Sean Monaghan. Monty? Yeah, I think he's going to, any time the Flames have a game-winning goal, I think he's going to either score it or assist on it. You know, it's cool to think about while we're thinking about Jelena. Um, I think it's pretty awesome, too, that, you know, Jelena's assistant coach, Conroy's up in the office. Like, we've still got these guys that were here last time we did this hanging around the organization yeah and like Jelena can give his experience not only when he was with the flames but he also had uh series winning goals if i recall with edmonton and vancouver and these aren't crusty old guys these guys are still both fairly young yeah so you know they can show like a say to the young guys like what it's like in those situations because Oh, I think Jelen has done it four or five or six times in his career of overtime game and series winning goals. So, you know, if the Flames are in a situation where they can advance to round two, I think he'll be invaluable in that regard. Probably. Well, Matt, let's wrap it up for this week. We'll be back early next week after the first three games of the series. 
And hopefully we're looking at a uh, position at that point where the Flames are up on the Canucks. Yeah, and as always, go Flames, go. And I can't wait for Sunday for Game 3. It'll be absolutely amazing to be, gonna be in the Sea of the Red. Yep, wow. I'm going to be there. That'll be a phenomenal game to be at. Oh, yeah. I'll be having difficulties with my voice probably on our next show. <laughs> Before we go, I want to remind Flames fans that this time of year is a fantastic time to party. Probably everyone's going to go to the Sea of Red in your local bar and that sort of thing. Please enjoy the playoffs responsibly. Um, we don't want, you know, some of the problems that we were having in 04. We don't want anyone drinking and driving. So enjoy the run. Make the most out of this run, but enjoy it responsibly. Yeah, we don't want to see anybody get hurt or anything from drinking and driving we want everybody to be alive so they can cheer on the flames all the way and not only that let's not become vancouver fans let's not riot if the flames you know lose this round let's show people that the calgary flames fans in the sea of red are some of the classiest fans in the national hockey league if the flames do lose be like in 04 when we lost game seven and go out and cheer them on anyway celebrate their successes so matt enjoy the first couple games safely and i'll talk to you next week after game three yeah who would have thought go flames go Walk in the left corner for again again the left circle again left shot joseph save rebound yeah! Yeah! yeah baby yeah baby my kid gentlemen scores the flames win it one nothing yeah baby Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.